When I was in fourth grade, let me let me ask, uh, do you all remember that phrase, uh, goody little two-shoes, anybody? Uh, well, fourth grade Jeremy was straight up a goody little two-shoes, I swear. He says like it's some sort of surprise, right? Yeah, it seems about right. Uh, but I was. I was a good kid when I was in school. Specifically, it was in fourth grade. I, I always stood in line, right? I, I always raised my hand when I needed to say something. I was always nice to my uh, fellow fourth grade uh, classmates, right? Even if they weren't nice to me. I was friends with everyone and anyone. And one day, I was actually offered something that was too good to be true. Too good to be true. You see, at the time, when I went to Leif Nelson, um, we had this program there. I don't, I'm pretty sure they don't do it anymore. But it was called the Bulldog Brigade. The Bulldog Brigade, and what it was, was honestly just this, like, glorified hall monitor program. Do they still have hall monitors? Is that a... Yeah, that's probably a good idea um, not to do that anymore. But, but if I'm being real with you, fourth grade Jeremy really wanted to be a part of the Bulldog Brigade. There was just so much, like, prestige, right? There was so much acclaim. They had these cool, like, high-vis vests that they let them wear. They had bulldogs on the back. It was rad. They, they got to carry on clipboards and write people tickets and infractions and whatnot. They, they commanded respect. They were given unbridled authority. They were a force for good and justice. Ever. I'm just kidding. <laughs> one day, though, one day, my, my dream came true. True. And I was invited to join the ranks of the Bulldog Brigade. Real talk. I think I got pictures somewhere. I, like, I think I was like knighted by the, the Bulldog in the costume, right? And they were placed, uh, yeah, it was, it was legit. It was legit. And honestly, if I'm being honest, I loved it. I loved being a part of the Bulldog Brigade. Being a hall monitor was so rad because I could finally be that force for good that was so desperately needed on the playground because none of the teachers cared, right? I could stand up for the little guy and, and put those mean bullies in their place. At least that's what I thought was happening because in reality, I had no power and all of my tickets wound up in the garbage can. But still, agent of justice. I think we got it got it going. But at one point, though, one point, things began to change. You see, the whole, like, being friends with everybody and anybody shtick, it, it was all well and good when you're, like, minding your own business, right? It's all well and good when you're doing your own thing. But once you put on the badge, it changes things. It changes things. And kids, they don't really like being friends with other kids that try to get them in trouble all the time. And eventually the cost of the vest, it began to wear on me. Friends that I'd had for years at this point wanted nothing to do with me anymore, even when I was off duty. And it was a bummer, man. So after a few weeks of living as the class narc, it, it started to get to me. Lunchtime became this lonely ordeal recess. It just wasn't the same anymore. And one day, in a moment of like pure desperation, I swear I hit my breaking point, and when I was on duty, I actually, I, I saw a group of kids bullying another kid. And instead of, you know, being a force for good and justice, I became crooked. Instead of coming to the defense of the vic victim, I shamefully admit that I began to join in on the teasing. And the kicker, the kicker is this, church. Just as I started to join in on picking on this kid, who else but the teacher who was in charge of the Bulldog Brigade walks by and overhears it all. He was my favorite teacher as well. Let me ask, have you ever done anything that you like immediately regretted before? Stunner said something that instantly this like wave of regret and shame comes over you. It's like that, that Hagrid meme, right? I shouldn't have said that. My wife laughs. She's a Harry Potter nerd. It's fine. 
Yeah, but this one, this this event was like that immediate regret for me. It was one of those things like where you know it's not right. You know that whatever you're doing or you're saying, it isn't good, but you're doing it anyways. And the whole time there's this like voice inside of you screaming not to do whatever it is that you're doing. Now, some people call this a conscience, right? Some people call it conviction, Whatever you call it, it was one of the first times in my life that I really recognized this feeling before. As for the aftermath, obviously I ended up uh, losing my badge and my gun. Um, I ended up getting the first pink slip of my life that day. I remember when I got home, I told my parents uh, what happened. And before I could even get words out of my mouth, I just like lost it, right? Before I even walked through the door getting off the bus, I lost my mind. I, I started just crying. And it was one of those like ugly cries too, right? The one where you can't catch your breath and just, right? Like, and, and it's snot everywhere. It, it, was, it was so bad, church, that, that my parents, they didn't even punish me because they saw how broken I was over this instance. They saw how much I had already regretted this poor decision decision and I don't think they could bear to stack any more on top of me it was it was an interesting day in the life of Jeremy this morning we are jumping back into our series that we've been in for the past five weeks so far on the book of Nehemiah and in this series just in case you missed the last month of talks uh, we're, we're looking at the story of Israel rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem after their exile in Babylon and as we do, we're seeing how despite things like hardship and pain and confrontation, the, the people of Israel, they actually got to see firsthand how our God is a God of his word and how he keeps every single promise that he makes. And the goal of this series is, is to see how we too, as we pursue God and as we pursue his kingdom, we too can be this active part of building God's kingdom in the here and now. And not only that, but we get to see how even today in a world full of chaos and pain, we can see that our God is still a God of his word. Amen. And today, as we dive into this next chapter of Nehemiah's story, I want to talk about regret. I want to talk about our consciences. I want to talk about conviction, whatever you want to call it. I want to talk about regret. And I want to talk about how, how God, he doesn't simply want us to build walls and structures, but he wants us to build his kingdom. And building God's kingdom, it starts when we begin to align ourselves with him. Amen? Before we dive in, though, as always, let's open up to our God in prayer today. Join me, church. Father God, we thank you this morning. We thank you that we get to do this, God. We get to spend this time together. We get to learn about you. We get to become more like you, Jesus. And that's our number one prayer, is that today when we leave this place, that we would look more like you than, when we were, than how we did when we came in, Jesus. So speak to us today. Speak directly to our hearts, God. Give us that conviction of our our sin this morning, and lead us to you, our God. We praise you. We say these things in your mighty name. Everyone said, amen. Amen. So if you're taking notes or following along this morning, we're back in the book of Nehemiah, and this morning we're going to be in chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. And just in case this is your first time with us as we've been in this series, I do want to give you a little catch-up before we dive fully into our talk today. So for the past, the past five weeks or so, we've been uh, following the story of Nehemiah, who was an Israelite serving as the cupbearer for the king of Persia. And after hearing about the devastated state of Jerusalem, even after the exile had been lifted, Nehemiah is stirred uh, by God to begin to take action. He prays to God, seeking guidance and strength, and eventually he convinces the king to let him go rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Not only that, but he also convinced the king to pay for it too, right? And then he, uh, he, he gets to Jerusalem, he, he uh, inspects the wall under the cover of night, and then he gathers all the people of, of Israel together to share his vision. He inspires them to join in this monumental task of rebuilding. And as they did, last week we learned that opposition after opposition would come their way. And by prayer, fortification, and unity, they were able to overcome and complete this wall in actually only 52 days. 
Now, between last week's verses in Nehemiah 4 and today's in Nehemiah 8, a few things have happened. Mostly, it involves Nehemiah beginning to step up and becoming the leader that God called him to be. I believe in this, this timeline, he uh, is actually made the governor of, of the, the region. Um, but he's, it tells us about how he's doing things like, like tending to the poor Israelites, becoming this champion for justice, things like that, right? But for today's talk, we're going to focus on when the walls, they were finally completed. Because even though the physical work was done, right, just because the walls were finished, it doesn't mean that God was finished with his people. It doesn't mean that the work was over. Because as we've said, God, I think he cares less about structures and walls and he cares more about building his kingdom in the here and the now. So for the next couple of minutes, I want to talk about how when it, when it, what it takes to build the kingdom of God. As we, as we read how the Israelites, they began to respond once the building project was completed, I want to look at a few specific things that they began to do in order to bring them back into rhythm and to bring them back into right standing with God and in his kingdom. So the first thing that we can see today is this. If we want to build the kingdom of God, we need to return to our roots. If you're taking notes, write that down today. We need to return to our roots. And don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about simply things like traditions or rituals and whatnot. But I think that if we want to see the kingdom of God begin to flourish in our midst, we need to return to the roots of this thing that we call Christianity. It says this in Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, and then verses 7 through 8. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra, the priest, brought out the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men and the women and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. And then it skips a few and goes to seven. The Levites instructed the people of the law while they were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving meaning to the people that understood what was being read. So a little bit of a read there, but I think this, this scene that is painted in these verses is so important for us today. Because this scene, to me at least, it, it lays out what it looks like for God's people to begin to get back to their roots. Not just as individuals, but as a group, corporately as well. We're told that after the walls were finished that there came a time when Ezra, who was the, the guy that led the second wave back from Babylon about, what, like 13 years prior, I think. Uh, Ezra, he, uh, he began to lead this push for another cultural and spiritual revival, right? He gets up before the people. He begins to read God's word. And, and we're also told that it didn't end there, but that after each like reading session, the Levites, they would actually go out into the crowd and further teach and explain what was said, helping the other people understand the kind of people God wanted them to be. And church, this is so important, especially when you consider the fact that nearly all of the people, all of the Israelites in, that were present in this group, they were all returning from exile as well. Something we see from their time in exile is that for many of the Israelites, as they went through this terrible season, their faith was definitely placed on the back burner. And when you consider that the people that returned to Israel in our verses today, they're like two to three generations removed from the people that lived in Israel beforehand, what you end up with are people that have no idea who God is, of people that have no idea what he expects from them. Why? Because they didn't have anyone to teach it to them. Because they were all so... See, don't you hate it when you lose a word that was in your head before and now it's just gone? They were all so focused on simply surviving. So as a result, before a spiritual revival could begin to happen, they had to get back to their roots. They had to get back to the understanding of who God is and what he expects from them as his people. In church, if I'm being honest, there are times where I can see some really, really close similarities within our culture today. Now, 
over the past three years since I've been here and we've had a lot of talks, we've, we've talked a lot about things like statistics and stuff, right? And, and what's important to know is one statistic is, is that currently, for the first time in our nation's history ever, less than 50% of people, of Americans, consider themselves Christian. Less than 50% consider themselves followers of Jesus. And as a result, we have so many people in our country who have no clue about God. They have no clue about who he is, right? Uh, Sure, they've probably heard people preaching turn or burn at some point in their lives, but outside of that, many people have no clue about God or Jesus or what they stand for or how they want us to live our lives. And if I'm being honest, and even though I hate admitting this, I I think the church might be to blame, at least partially. Think about it for just a second. We love to say pretty words. We love having people like me getting up on platforms just like this, delivering like motivational speeches, right? We love singing pretty songs. We love putting on great services that makes everyone feel welcome and comfortable. But I think in our pursuit of this welcoming experience, I think maybe we might have forgotten about one of the most important aspects of this thing called Christianity, and that, my friends, is discipleship is the process of becoming like Jesus and becoming rooted in him. And what it boils down to, church, is this, is if the church stops trying to look like Jesus, that means all we're doing is trying to make ourselves feel better rather than actually being better. And if we want to build God's kingdom today, church, I feel that discipleship, it needs to be a top priority. We need to get back to the roots, and we need to be fishers of men again, amen. And, when, and we need to be a people that takes God and his commands seriously. We need to get back to having this full understanding of who God is and why we need Jesus. And not only that, but we need a full understanding that that Jesus, he's called us to a new, better life than the one that we lived before we met him. So that brings us to our second point today. Number one is we need to return to our roots. Number two is this, if we want to be part of building God's kingdom, we need to embrace our identity. Write that down today. We need to embrace our identity as what? As kingdom builders. In verses 13 through 17, we get to see the Israelites begin to rediscover their identity as God's people. This is what it says. On the second day of that month, the heads of the families, along with the priests and the Levites, they gathered around Ezra, the teacher, to give attention to the words of the law. They found written in the law which the Lord had commanded through Moses that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month and that they should proclaim his word and spread it throughout the towns in Jerusalem. Go out to the hill country and bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees, and from myrtles, palms, and shade trees. Make temporary shelters as it is written. So the people went out and brought back branches, built themselves temporary shelters on their own roofs, in their courtyards, in the courts of the house of God, in the square by the water gate, and the the one by the gate of Ephraim. The whole company that had returned from exile built temporary shelters and lived in them from the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day the Israelites had not celebrated it like this, and their joy was very great. I know that was a bit of reading. But again, I think this verse, these verses are so important for us today. See, after the initial spiritual revival on day one of the celebrations, the Israelites, they, they didn't just call it quits there, right? But they, they were back at it the next day. They were eager for another round of Ezra's law readings. And, and it was during this session that they learned how God wanted them to celebrate the feasts of old. And this discovery it sparked this, co- this collective decision to begin to reinstate these traditions and and the word tells us that as they did they had an absolute blast right as they celebrated it was like they were walking through the pages of their own history books they began to reconnect with the narrative that had uh, defined them as God's people for generations to them the celebrations they were so much more than just rituals and tradition but they were a powerful reminder of their identity which was finally being pieced back together and strengthened with each passing moment 
And when it comes to us as followers of Jesus, though most of us probably aren't uh, Jewish and we probably aren't going to be taking part in these different feasts and whatnot that they used to back in the day, we can, as Jesus followers, begin to rediscover our identities in Jesus in the same way. When we gather, when we praise, when we take communion together, when we talk about God and the things that he's done, what it does is it's this reminder to ourselves of our new identities in Jesus and that we're called to be the salt and the light of this world. And if I can give you a perfect example, at least to me, I think, honestly, it would be our time together this Wednesday in Bible study. We had such a good time this week uh, hanging out together, talking about God, talking about each other, learning how we can be more like him. And and real talk, when I left the church on Wednesday night, I, I left just thinking to myself, wow, what a great time with God's people. I left thinking, man, that was church. If we want to build God's kingdom, we need that identity. We need to be kingdom builders. We need to walk with the mandate that we are the church. That church isn't just something we go to, but church is who Jesus has called us to be. Which leads us to our final point this morning. One was we need to return to our roots. Two was we need to embrace our identities. And number three, if we want to build God's kingdom, we need to confront our convictions. We need to confront our convictions. Write that down this morning, church. We need to confront our convictions. Back in verses uh, 9 through 10, we're told how in the initial reading of God's word on that first day after they had finished the wall and started these celebrations, We're told that the Israelite people, they were being moved and that they were being stirred. This is what it says. Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest and teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people, they said to them, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice foods and sweet drinks and said some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is our strength. So as they listened, we're told that this wave of emotion began to sweep over the people and that they began to weep and to cry out to God. And the reasons for their tears, it's not spelled out for us, but it's not that hard to imagine that maybe a deep sense of remorse or or regret had begun to wash over them, right? They were likely reflecting on the times that they had strayed from their path, right? The, The moments that they had fallen short of their promises and their covenant with God. Yet in the midst of this scene, Nehemiah and Ezra, they step out and they step forward with this message, not of condemnation, but a message of hope. They declared that the the, the day that they were experiencing now was holy to the Lord, a time not for sorrow, but a time of celebration. They urged the people to, to put aside their grief and their sorrow and to take part in these feasts and to revel in the festivities for it was the joy of the Lord that they would find their strength. The strength not to just endure, but a strength that could cause them to build and renew. And it's here that we get one of those verses, right? One of the famous ones, one of those verses that everybody knows, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. Now, something interesting about these verses, though, is that in the the original Hebrew, the word used for strength was the word ma'oz, Ma'oz. And what's interesting is that this word, which is actually used uh, about 34 times in the Old Testament, it's only ever translated as the word strength exactly one time, and that's here in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. In every other place, it's translated as a place or a means of safety or protection. A place of safety, like I don't know, like a mountain stronghold or, or like a fortress, right? A place where you can find refuge from the storms of this life. 
And the implications, I think, of this are huge. This one word that we can translate to a new meaning is so big because instead of being just simply a source that gives us strength when we're feeling down, to me, this this explains something so much more impactful to our lives because it tells us that the joy of the Lord is not just our strength, but it's our refuge. When the people of Israel, they realized their failures and shortcomings and keeping their covenant with God, we see that they weren't left to wallow in their sorrows, but instead they were directed to find refuge in the joy that God takes in restoring his people. And this is still true for us today, church. Because when we find ourselves in the midst of the storms of this life, when we falter, when we succumb to sin and we stray from God, things like grief, things like remorse and regret, if we let them, they can be this overwhelming force that that won't speak life to us, but will speak death. But thanks to the way our God works, we can find a profound comfort in knowing that quite possibly one of God's favorite things to do is to restore his people. That's his joy. He, he delights in it. And his joy, it's not simply a passing, like fleeting emotion, but it's a fortress. It's a mighty fortress that we can seek refuge in. And it's in this divine joy that we begin to be transformed. It's in this divine joy that we begin to be made new. Now, that's not to say that we can simply ignore the spirit stirring within us. Because as followers of Jesus, we're we're not walking around this world alone, but we're told that we're actually housing a divine presence, right? That the, the Holy Spirit has made us his dwelling place. And what he does when we find ourselves veering off track, he starts to nudge us, right? It's like having almost like this internal compass of sorts that that points out when we're not fully aligned with what God wants for us. And when that realization hits, it's our cue to begin to pivot ourselves, right? To rethink our actions, to rethink our attitudes towards life and, and sin and righteousness. And my friends, this is what we call in the Christian community, we call it repentance, Repentance, And sure, a lot of you might have heard that word before, especially if you grew up in the church. Um, and a lot of people, they see this, this, this concept of repentance as like a buzzkill, right? They see it as a downer. But if I can be honest with you, I think this concept of repentance is actually one of the most beautiful things that can ever happen to us. Because repentance, it's not just about feeling really bad about yourself and, and, and hoping that you don't get, you know, a cosmic spanking one day. But, but repentance, it's about this, this total, like, mindset overhaul that leads us to a lifestyle makeover. It's about seeing sin for what it is. And and instead of just being okay with it being in our lives, it's this decision to begin to walk in the opposite direction of it. Instead of just being, you know, accepting our fate, right, accepting this as our the hands that were dealt, that we are all sinners. Instead, the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to turn around completely and walk in the other direction at its core. Repentance is about getting back in sync with God. At its core, repentance is about like hitting that refresh button on our spiritual lives. It's a process that's not just like saying, God, I'm sorry, but it's a process that demonstrates, God, I'm changed. So as we close today, my main challenge for you all this week as we uh, begin to uh, look back on what we've read today My main challenge for you all is to get back to your roots. My main challenge is to embrace who you are as a kingdom builder. But most importantly, I would invite you to begin to take inventory of your life. And if need be, repent. Begin to look at yourself through the lens that God sees you. Not to bum you out. Not to make you feel really bad about how much you missed the mark, but to give God the opportunity to begin to change you. Because I'll tell you, God will not change you if you don't think you need to be changed. 
If you don't think that, that, that you need Jesus, then Jesus ain't going to do nothing for you. But if you come to the realization that you are a broken person, that you are a sinner in need of a Savior, that is when God can begin his mighty work within you. It gives God the opportunity to change you, but it also gives yourself the opportunity to begin to take refuge within the joy of the Lord. Amen? Amen. As we come to a close this morning, church, would you, would you join me in prayer?